Today we are looking at Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 7, where we find the letter to the church at Philadelphia. And this is what the Lord Jesus tells John to give to the messenger of the church at uh, Philadelphia so that uh, he can instruct them. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, <clears throat> and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Philadelphia happens to be one of the two churches for which Christ gives no condemnation. This is the faithful church. This is the church, though small, is hanging in there, is making a difference, is fighting the good fight of faith. Now, the city Philadelphia, uh, most of you know that Philadelphia means brotherly love. Phileo. Love, Adelphos, brother, brotherly love. What's that? I'm wearing a shirt, Philadelphia. Okay. It, it is uh, something we Greek students learned early, Philadelphia. It was founded by the people of Pergamum, and it's said to owe its name not from the the brotherly love part, like there's a like there's, the city is all that loving necessarily, but it was named for uh, Adelus uh, Philadelphus. Uh, he was the king of per Pergamum from uh, 159 to 138 BC, and uh, supposedly the city got its name from his name. It's located about 30 to 40 miles southeast of Sardis, and its, its location, its vineyards, and its wine production made it a wealthy and commercially important city. Even though it was smaller than some of these other cities that we've talked about, it was still a very important one. It uh, was destroyed by an earthquake in 17 AD, the same earthquake that destroyed another city. And the aftershocks kept the people so worried that most of them moved outside the city limits. <laughs> you know, I guess if that stone starts falling or starts shaking and you wonder if it's going to fall, you want to be someplace where things can't fall on you. Following the earthquake, it was temporarily renamed Neo Caesarea, meaning Caesar's new city, out of gratitude for the emperor's aid in rebuilding the city. It had a Jewish congregation there, as well as temples to Zeus and, and uh, Caesar. And uh, a church was founded in Philadelphia. <clears throat> now this is how Christ introduces himself to this church. 
the words of the Holy One, the true one. He is holy. And that, that adjective, though used uh, for followers of Christ, most often and most appropriately refers to God. It is ultimately His quality. He is ultimately set apart from all others holy, blameless, without sin. <clears throat> we are to be holy in that we follow His example, that we seek to emulate Him, but we all know that our holiness is quite different from God's holiness. He is the true one. He is the one who tells the truth. He's the source of truth. He is the embodiment of truth. And these people who are, as you will find out shortly, and if you were paying attention when I was reading the passage, you noticed it already, there's a synagogue of Satan here, as well as there was in another city we discussed. A synagogue of people who thought they were Jews, but were not, were actually liars. Why? Because they, they didn't follow Jesus Christ. And not only that, they persecuted Christians. And it seems that in this city there was a strong persecution against Christians, Christian Jews who wanted to believe in the Messiah, but they also wanted to be a part of the synagogue and maintain their Jewish roots. After all, Jesus was the fulfillment of all that the synagogue stood for. <clears throat> but they were excommunicated. They were cast out because of their faith. They need to see Christ as the Holy One and the True One in contrast to those imposters, imposters who were trying to tell them they weren't right with God because they weren't following the Jewish faith the way they were supposed to. He is the one who has the key of David. Now, the key of David is a reminder of something that the Old Testament talked about in Isaiah 22, 22. God accuses in that passage Shebna, who is serving as a scribe and as a treasurer, though he's a foreigner. He accuses Shebna of betraying his stewardship his word and his trust. And God says that he will depose Shebna from his office and will replace him with Eliakim. And this is what it says there in that passage. In that day, I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe and I will bind your sash on him and will commit your authority to his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now notice, and I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Jesus Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of that authority, that responsibility. He has the key of David. He has the ultimate authority. Christ is declaring to this church that just like there are imposters, those imposters will be replaced and, and the authority will be given to the true people of God. Remember what Jesus said to Matthew, or to his disciples in Matthew? He says that he's giving them what? The keys to the kingdom. And what they bind on earth will be bound where? And what they loose on earth will be loosed where? 
What he's saying is he's entrusting his church now with authority, the authority to share the gospel. Because how do you open heaven to people? You share the gospel. Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we, we have the authority to open the doors of the kingdom to people by sharing the gospel. And if they reject that, then that is their binding. In fact, uh, Jesus tells his disciples, if they don't receive you, what are you to do? Shake off the dust and move on. I know your works. <clears throat> the church is commended here. They have works. And they have a little power. How many, how many of us feel sometimes that that's all we have is just a little power? I mean, we're small. What difference can we make? I like what Yoda says. You think size matters? Look at me. Size does not matter with God. It's not how big you are. It's not how important you are. It's all about the God you serve and what He can do through us. That's what's important. You have a little power. You've kept my word. You've not denied my name. Faithfulness. <clears throat> Folks, faithfulness is a key to the Christian life. Faithfulness. Not denying Him. Keeping His word. The people who are willing to follow Him faithfully will find an open door. He says, I have set before you, verse 8, an open door, which no one is able to shut. Now, in Scripture, there are two ways in which door is used. Jesus talks about being the door of the sheepfold, which means what? He's the way in. He's the way out. That's how you get into the sheepfold, through the door. In Revelation 3.20, what does Jesus say? I'm knocking on your door. If you let me in, I will come in and fellowship with you. Door is an entrance. In uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, John sees an open door to heaven. So, an open door here means, first of all, people may tell you that you're not right with me because you're not the kind of Jew they are. But he says, that's not what matters. There's an entrance I'm providing. I am the door. Heaven's doors are open because of what Jesus Christ has done, not only for Jews now, but also for Gentiles, for everyone, anyone and everyone, the doors open now because of Jesus Christ. They needed to understand and hear that and be encouraged by that. The doors open. All you have to do is come in. In the scriptures, it's also used as a, an opportunity, a door of opportunity. For instance, in Acts chapter 14, verse 27, we find, And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how He had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. An opportunity to share the gospel with the Gentiles. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, <clears throat> uh, Paul says, 
for a wide door for effectual work has been opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Now, just because there are opportunities doesn't mean that there aren't challenges. Many opportunities bring adversaries. A door of opportunity. Which is it? Is it entrance or is it opportunity? When he says, I have placed before you an open door, is it an open door of entrance? Well, in the context, I, that's primarily what it is. It's an open door for them, but not just for them. It's also an opportunity for us to point others to the open door, the door of entrance into the kingdom. When he opens a door, no one is able to shut it. What opportunities is God presenting to us? What opportunities is God presenting to you? Do you know what? I believe that in order to be faithful to Christ, we're going to have to take advantage of opportunities to share the gospel. Here's the thing. There are many ways to do that. There are postcards and tracks and, you know, all kinds of things that you can do to share the gospel with other people. It's not just pigeonholing people. <laughs> I don't try to do that anyway. I look for opportunities to bring the gospel into the conversation, but I'm not going to force it on people. You see, here's the thing. I'm not responsible for the results. I'm not responsible for how people respond to the message. What I am responsible for is presenting the message. I can say, there's a door right there. That's the one you need to go through. Some people, because I suggested it, are not going to want to take that door. They're just that stubborn, aren't they? I'm not going to push you through the door. I'm not going to trip you up if you try to go another way. <laughs> that's not my job. My job is to point to the door, to say that's the door that you need to enter. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm pointing people to him. If they don't choose to respond, that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is simply to share with them. The condemnation, not there, but the challenge is there. First of all, in this age of compromise and in this age where there's many challenges to our faith, I think this word that um, he shares with them is very important for us. He says, because you have been faithful to me and not denied my name, he says, I will keep you from the hour of trial. Now, there are two possibilities here. Keep from. <clears throat> Does that mean that he's going to keep them out of? that hour of trial? Or is he going to keep them through that hour of trial? Now, here's the thing. I learned this in Greek as I was studying. The primary rule about prepositions is that you never base a doctrine on them. Because in the Greek, prepositions can mean a bunch of different things. For instance, uh, you know, where you read in the Gospels about them coming up out of the water <clears throat> could mean that they were standing close to the water and they were moving up the hill. Or they could have been standing in the water and decided to step out of the water. Or it could mean they were under the water and they came up out of the water. Now, when you read that, you put a certain idea to that. <clears throat> that's not there with the preposition. The preposition is very flexible. And here is the same thing. To keep you from something, that preposition that's used there, 
can mean to keep you completely out of it or to see you through it. The only other time it's used is in John 17, 15. This is what Jesus says. <clears throat> this is his great priestly prayer for us. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but I ask that you keep them from the evil one. His protection doesn't remove the evil one, does it? His protection preserves them as they face the evil one to keep them from being overwhelmed or overcome by the evil one. That was his prayer. Keeping them, whether it's keeping them out of that hour or keeping them through that hour, the emphasis is on keeping them. Do you believe that God can keep you through anything you're going to have to face. Now, we would prefer that he keep us away from it. Don't let us even go near it. Don't let us have to go through it. <clears throat> but the truth is, God is more concerned about protecting you in the arena than he is about removing you from the arena. I will keep you from the hour of trial. It's coming on the whole world. <clears throat> now we know that in their day, there was an hour of trial coming. That was a precursor to other hours of trial the book of Revelation talks about. Their hour of trial was when the Romans came in and destroyed the temple and upset the whole course of events in that whole area. That church is told God's going to keep them. But the book of Revelation wasn't written just for them, was it? It was written for us. I love what First Peter says. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is perish imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. These are the words. Kept in heaven for you. We are kept, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You are guarded, you are protected, you are kept by faith. Through His power, you are kept. You don't have to worry about what life is going to throw at you. You don't have to worry about the challenges that will come your way. You don't even have to worry about whether He's going to take you out of this mess. Hey, by the way, we're all going to be taken out of this mess. But you don't have to worry about when and how and where you just have to know one thing. You are kept by the power of God. He is going to take care of you. That's all you need to know. So hold fast and don't let anyone steal your crown, he says to this church. We need to hear that. Listen. Listen. We are going to be tempted and tested and tried in our culture particularly. We're going to be tested <clears throat> to discount, to refuse or reject our faith, to not allow our faith to make a difference in the way we act or the way we talk or the way we live? In other words, what you need to do according to this culture is to keep your faith 
right in here. Keep your mouth closed. Keep your faith in here. And don't let it out. I'm going to tell you, faith that is real faith can't be kept bottled up in here. I don't know about you, but my faith affects every aspect of my life. It's what I say. It's where I go. It's what I do. It's who I am. Now, to the church that lived in a city where the earthquake had driven them out, where they didn't know very much stability, this is what Christ says to this church. The one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. You know what a pillar is? It's a foundation. It's, it's the stability of the building. Never shall he go out. You don't have to run away from this city because its builder and maker is God. It has foundations. You belong. And for people who want to belong, who feel like they don't belong, who need to belong, the Bible says you, can't, you have a place where you can belong. And that is in the body of Christ. He says, I'll write the name of my God on you. Now, not literally write name, but if he writes his name on you, I wish I'd have brought my, my ladder in here. I have a step stool that I take with me wherever I go to work for Kroger. I used to depend on the store having one available, and I found out that is fruitless. They are very hard to find. And if you find one, it's usually under someone else. <clears throat> so I went out to Home Depot and I bought myself a step stool. But I don't want anyone mistaking that step stool for a Kroger step stool or for their own step stool. So I wrote on that step stool in about four different places, prominent places, property of Dan Shapley. Why did I do that? Because I wanted people to know that was my step stool. That's what he's saying here. God wants you to know for certain that you belong to him. Also, the name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem, that comes down from God out of heaven. We read about that in Revelation chapter 21. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what God is going to provide? Not only will you belong to God, but you belong to a place. A place He is preparing for you. I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus says. And if He's gone to prepare a place, what will He do? Come again and receive us unto himself, that where he is, there we may be also. And he says, I'll write my own new name on you. You belong to Jesus. You belong to his family, his body. That's what we just celebrated in the Lord's Supper. You belong to you belong because of what Christ has done. You belong because you've received that. You've accepted that. You've adopted that. You belong. I need to mention a couple other things before I let you go. First of all, uh, this is the second time we've encountered Jews who are called the synagogue of Satan. I know that Christians have often been accused of being Jewish haters. That we're told that 
a part of that is that we hold against the Jewish nation and against the Jewish people the fact that they crucified Jesus. But the truth is, and we know this, it wasn't just Jews or Romans that sent Jesus to the cross. Who sent him there? All of us, because he went there because of our sin. We can't blame the Jews for that any more than we can blame the Romans because ultimately the, through the plan of God, He purchased there our salvation. He paid for our sin. So what sent Him there was our sin. At first, Jews were strong persecutors of Christians. Remember the Apostle Paul. Before he became the Apostle Paul, he was what? Saul, the Christian persecutor. He was known as a persecutor of the churches. And because of that, he felt he was a chiefest of sinners. But he came around, didn't he? He, says he found he was going the wrong way and he took a U-turn. Even if Jewish people have been opponents of Christianity and even persecuted Christians, what does Jesus tell us about our persecutors? What, how does he tell us to respond to persecution? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you and despitefully use you. So Christians have no reason to be Jew haters. We ought to love them. We ought to be willing to share the gospel with them. But we do know one thing. How do Jews come to God? The same way we do because there is no other name under heaven whereby men and women must be saved. Acts 4.12. John 14.6. Jesus says again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's one way. There's one entrance. For Jews and Gentiles, only one way. And that's through Jesus. And the second thing that I need to say is if you're a Christian, you don't need to be afraid. Do you hear me? We don't need to be reactionary and fearful and... and uh, spouting all kinds of fear out there. We don't have to be afraid. We are kept by the power of God through faith. <clears throat> we will be kept either from or through the hour of trial. You don't need to be afraid. If you're afraid, that spirit does not come from God. Where does it come from? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That's right. So if you're afraid, look to God. Look to the one who can take care of you, who will take care of you. And don't be afraid. If you are afraid, come to him and allow him to fill you with his power and peace. Because this is not a time for fear. This is a time for love, power, and a sound mind. We need that more today than we've ever needed it. I want to encourage you. God has a lot of work for us to do. But we can do it. 
Not because of who we are, but because of who He is. Let's pray.